And praise God to be here in this renewed, revived, renovated gymnasium in the school that we've been away from uh, for several months. And so we thank God to be back here and to be worshiping God and giving praise to his wonderful name. And it's appropriate that we are back here because next week we'll be celebrating our 15th anniversary on Thanksgiving Sunday. So we thank God to be back here in time uh, for that to happen. Uh, before the message this morning, I'd like to have a short prayer. And the message today is on sharing our faith, a, a very important message because many Christians do not. Uh, let us pray. Lord, I just pray that you will anoint this message, that you will empower your speaker, that you will receive all glory and honor through this, and that by your Holy Spirit that you may speak to our hearts, that you, Lord, have commissioned each one of your followers to go and to tell people about you. Lord, help us to be aware of our responsibilities to go and to share the good news, and that good news is you, Jesus. We thank you for what you will do through this message today in encouraging us and in challenging us to be the people of God you called us to be and to do what you've called us to do. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. There's a story told by Charles Cockroft in his sermon, Am I My Brother's Keeper? He said, I heard a story about a, a guy who applied for a job as an usher at a theater in the mall. As part of the interview process, the manager asked him, what would you do in case a fire breaks out? The young man answered, don't worry about me, I can get out fine. That's exactly how many in today's world respond to a lost and dying world around them. If you ask them, what would you do if Jesus came back tomorrow? They would quickly respond, oh, don't worry about me, I'll be fine. But what is all too easy to forget is that you're an usher. It isn't enough just to get out yourself. You are responsible for helping others know the way. We are our brother's keeper. We have responsibility to warn others about what they face in coming judgment because of their sin. We are to usher people into the way who is Jesus. Studies have shown the majority of Christians have not and do not share their faith with others. Why? Three reasons. Fear. Fear of rejection, rejection by family members, rejection by friends, rejection by fellow workers, and so they keep quiet. But we are told not to be bound by fear. 2 Timothy 1.7, ours is not a spirit of fear. Or people will say, I don't know what to say. I'm a brand new Christian. I haven't studied the, body, the Bible long enough. I'm not like the pastor. And so they keep quiet. But we see in James 1.5 that if we lack wisdom, we pray about it and we will be given the wisdom. And in being prepared, we need to memorize scripture. We need to have the word of God in our hearts so that as people ask us why we believe or as we have opportunities, we have the word of God right there with us, whether we have the Bible with us or not. Fear, we can give that over to God. Not having knowledge, we can pray to God for wisdom. Saying it's the responsibility only of Christian leaders is not scriptural. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said to all of his followers, go. He just didn't say to Christian leaders, go. He said to all his followers, go. D.T. Niles, in his book, That They May Have Life, said evangelism is witness. It is one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. P. 
People are spiritually hungry, facing spiritual death, yet we can tell them about Jesus, the bread of life. John 6, 35. Jesus, who can bring out rivers of living water from within them. John 7, 37 to 39. What are three things that we can do in our life as a follower of Jesus Christ? Three important things that all believers are called to do no matter what their age. Number one, testimony, your life, what you say and what you do. Your life silently testifies to what you believe and who you serve. People are watching you, whether at school, whether at work, whether in the neighborhood. People are looking at you. What are they seeing? Are they seeing Jesus in you through what you say and through what you do? Or are they seeing you in between Sundays acting like anyone else would act with the values of the world? In the following story, it brings that out. The young salesman was disappointed about losing a big sale. And as he talked with the sale manager, he lamented, I guess it just proves you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. The manager replied, son, take my advice. Your job is not to make him drink. Your job is to make him thirsty. So it is with evangelism, sharing our faith. Our lives should be so filled with Christ that they create a thirst for the gospel. People should say, oh, Lelaine, I see your life. What makes a difference in your life? Oh, Remy, I see your life. And there's something different about you. What is it? Oh, destiny. I see something in your life that's different. What is it? When people come and ask us, we have an opportunity to share that Christ is the difference. He is the one who has transformed and changed our life. But often people don't see any difference in our life. Because we have so conformed to the world as followers of Jesus Christ, they see no difference. Because we have stopped shining and reflecting Jesus in our life. What are people seeing in your life? Is your life being a testimony, a silent testimony to the power of God, to the transformation that has come in your life, surrender to Jesus as Lord of your life, amen? If people are seeing no difference in your life, then there is a problem with your life. If people see no difference in how you are acting and behaving in between Sundays, there is a problem in your life. When Henry Stanley went out in 1871 and found Dr. Livingston, he spent some months in his company, but Livingston never spoke to Stanley about spiritual things. Throughout those months, Stanley just watched the old man. People are watching you. Every day and everything you say and do, you are under observation. Livingston's habits were beyond his comprehension, and so was his patience. He could not understand Livingston's sympathy for the Africans. For the sake of Christ and his gospel, the missionary doctor was patient, untiring, eager, spending himself, and being spent for his master. Stanley wrote, when I saw that unwearied patience, that unflagging zeal, those enlightened sons of Africa, I became a Christian at his side. Though he never spoke to me about it. Jesus was reflected in his actions and by his words. Amen? I would say that Dr. Livingston that David Livingston served in that continent out of love. Love 
for the Lord and love for lost souls. His was a labor of love. Praise the Lord. Are people seeing something different in your life? Is your life itself being a testimony to the power of God to transform lives? If not, there is a problem. Because we are to reflect Jesus. John 3.30 says, he must increase, but I must decrease. It's not just being here on Sunday and putting on our Sunday face and our Sunday clothes. What happens when you're at work and there's a problem at work? Do you give in to the temptation to get angry, to snap at your fellow workers because you're under pressure? Those are the tests of our faith. Those are the times when we are challenged to reflect Jesus. Not when things are going well, but when things are going very, very unwell, very tough. What are people seeing in and through us? Are they seeing Jesus reflected in our lives? One day when I was in a rural area in Malawi, I saw an older Muslim man get onto the bus. And the bus was full. And I mean full. The local buses, when they're full, they're not just full of people. There were chickens and sugar cane and other things that people had carried onto the bus. Actually, when the bus stopped different times, there were sometimes there were so many things in between the back of the bus and the front, people climbed out the window to get out of the bus because it was so difficult to get to the front. So this day, this older man got on the bus, older Muslim man, and there were, there were no seats. So I got up and I offered him my seat. I did not know he was the representative for a very powerful Muslim chief in that area. And he was impacted by what I did, and he shared with the chief while well, this visiting Christian pastor got up and gave his seat to me. This was a testimony to Christ. Did I know he was a representative of a major Muslim chief? No. I, without even thinking much about it, to this older man, I got up and gave my seat to him. But it spread around the community what I had done. This, there are a lot of times we do something small, an act of kindness, and we do not know the impact it will have on that person's life or other people whom that person reflects and shares with. Amen? We do not know that small act of kindness, what impact it will have. I also share with people online. And I develop a relationship with people on, online. Yes, it's not the same as one-on-one -on -one in person, but when you have people in other countries, you can also develop a relationship with them and have opportunities to share Christ or to encourage them in the faith. And so with this young, or, or with this individual in Malawi who was older and who I thought was a Christian by the way his Facebook outline was, was described. So I shared with him uh, different scripture verses and articles. And then one day, he texted me. We were texting live, me in Canada, he in Malawi. One day he texted me and said, well, I've come to understand I've never been born again by the Spirit of God. How do I come to faith in Christ? And even if as a pastor, I was going, whoa, I didn't see that coming. But I had spent time to develop that relationship with him online. And I had an opportunity to introduce him to Christ. And now have an opportunity to share with him and to encourage with him in the faith. I believe Crichton is watching right now from Malawi. So I send greetings to him. But I use that example. We never know how God will use us. 
but it's developing that relationship with others. It's being live in a situation where we live a life that brings honor to God, where people see there's a difference in our life, and, and they come to us and say, why is there a difference? And you know what's sad? Even when that happens, many Christians change the conversation. They change the conversation. When there's a spiritual seeker who's hungry for God, and how sad that it's Christians who have an opportunity to introduce them to the way, to the source of hope and the source of peace, and the Christian is the one who changes the conversation. How tragic and how sad. It says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine. Where to reflect Jesus, the light of the world. Are people seeing Jesus reflected in your life? In the good times and the tough times. Where you live, where you work. 1 Peter 3.15, as I said, let people see Jesus in your life. So they become curious and ask you a reason for why you believe. Part of that verse in the first part, it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. So that means keep putting Christ first. Always be prepared to give a reason to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Are you always ready? It's not like we can say, like, say, like, consulate saying, well, tomorrow my fellow worker is going to come and ask me about my Christian faith. No. We don't get a little preparation like an exam and say, well, I'm going to have an opportunity to share Christ with this person tomorrow. No. Sometimes it comes right out of the blue, just like it did online with myself. But we're to be ready beforehand for those times when God will lead us to people who are spiritually hungry and ready to come into the kingdom of God, and God gives us that blessed opportunity to be there at the, one of the greatest miracles, the miracle of rebirth, of seeing a person transformed by the power of the living God through his word. Amen? Are you ready? Are you prepared? Do you know the word of God? Are you memorizing scripture? You're not going to have the Bible with you all the time. If Ireland's one day in, in his class, and right after class, someone comes up to Arlen and says, hey, hey I, 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 I heard you're a Christian. Why do you believe in that nonsense? We better be ready to explain why, because there is a God-given opportunity to share. Are you ready? Are you prepared? In Malawi, in an area I visited recently in July, before that, Christians here had given gifts of food to everyone in need. Whether people were Christian or Muslim or animist, the food went out. And it had an impact on the community. We provided 10 water pumps and piping that helped 10 different communities be involved in irrigation farming. And actually, next week, they'll have their first harvest to irrigation farming, and this has transformed 10 communities. So when I was there, and since I have been there, the power of God has been so great. There are many people coming to Christ. When meetings are held, they've, they've been having volleyball, soccer tournaments. In one tournament, 32 people came to Christ after the tournament. Another tournament, 80 people came to Christ. October 12th, they're having another major netball and volleyball tournament. But what was the preparation ahead of time? People seeing the love of God through the acts of Christians in giving out food without strings attached. Amen? That was a testimony. Our people seeing our life is making a difference. It has impact for the glory of God. So, number one is your life a testimony? Do people see that your allegiance to Jesus Christ has made a difference in your life? 
Some of the people that see it most evidently are friends and family who knew you before you became a Christian. And they are watching, some of them are watching for years and years. Because they're saying, oh, it's just a passing fad. Now, first year, second year, okay. Tenth year, fifteenth year, no. They know it's no longer a passing fad. I thank God that my sister, one of my sisters who recently died this year, went from a time where she was blowing smoke rings in my face as a young Christian, telling me not to tell any of her friends in that town that I was a Christian, to the point before she died where she was asking for prayer. Never give up on your family members. They are watching you to see whether what you profess is just words or whether it's real. So the first thing is, is your life a testimony? Has your life been changed? And do people see that change in you, where you work, where you live, where you study? If they don't, there is a problem. Because we are to reflect Jesus all the time, not just here on Sundays. The second thing is tell. Testimony, tell. We have been commanded, commanded, not advised, commanded, not suggested, commanded by Jesus to go tell others about him. Matthew 28, 18, this is not an option. If you have professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are commanded by Jesus to go and tell others. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. This is not an option to share our faith. If we have fear, pray to God. He will take the fear away. If we lack wisdom, pray to God. He will give you wisdom. Go and trust God. He will give you the ability to speak to others about him. How to tell. This gets into the nitty-gritty specifics. How, what are ways that we can be involved in in sharing our faith in person, where you live, or anywhere. Acts 1.8, we are to be like the early disciples and followers of Jesus called to be witnesses everywhere. Today, we don't have to go to a country in Asia or Africa or Central America or South America. Those countries are here represented here. People have come here from all over the world. And we have an opportunity when it says to go, we don't have to physically go to a country. It could be going next door or to an adjoining apartment unit where people are living who have come here from another country who do not profess Christ or have never even heard about Jesus. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We are to be witnesses as to what God has done in our life. We're not to keep quiet. We're not to keep it to ourselves. Jesus said, go. Be my witness. Share with others what impact your allegiance to me has made on your life, and it can make in their life as well. Amen? People are slaves to sin. How can they be broken free if they don't know how to break free? We have the opportunity to tell them, in Christ, you can be broken and brought into freedom. You can break those chains because Jesus has already broken those chains through his death on the cross. But if people don't know, they're going to continue to be enslaved. We have been called to provide them the answer of how they can break their chains through Jesus Christ. If you say to yourself, well, I can't go in person to share my faith. There are other ways that you could, we have no excuse. 
We come up with excuses as to why we can't share our faith with others. There's no reason to have an excuse because there's so many ways in which we can share our faith, even other than in person, one-on-one. -on -one. We can visit by phone. Oh, that person's too far away, so I, I just don't have the time on my agenda to visit. Do you have time to book in a 10 or 15 minute phone call with that person who may be struggling? I was led one day to call a Christian woman. It may, be, it may not just be non-Christians that God calls us to contact and call this Christian woman out of the blue. God later laid her name on my heart and she was suicidal, ready to commit suicide right there and then. And God called me to phone her. You may be called to contact a family member or a friend or fellow worker at a particular time. And at that time, that person may be struggling with depression. They may have no one to speak to. They may have no one to vent to. And through that phone call, you make a difference in their life. So we can phone. We can text. If you're cautious of, oh, I don't speak eloquently and I don't have the right text, you have autocorrect. <laughs> you can text perfectly now. No excuse with, with misspelling words unless autocorrect. You've got to be careful with autocorrect. I sometimes send text messages and autocorrect will correct my message and put in words that change the whole meaning. <laughs> so you better be careful with autocorrect. But where to text people? I am texting people in different parts of the world. Some are not Christians. Others are Christians who are mentoring by text. It doesn't take long to send a text, to compose, but it could make a difference in that person's life. Leave a message. If they don't respond by text, you phone. You can leave a message by phone. You can leave a message by text. Take the effort to be in contact with people. Connect with people by messenger or WhatsApp. You can connect with anyone anywhere in the world today through messenger and WhatsApp. You can connect with people who have no contact with Christians whatsoever, who go online looking for answers, and God can connect you. Don't say, oh, the mission field is way out there. Doesn't, I can't connect, connect to the mission field. I can't connect to, to those people who have never heard about Jesus. Now, in our technological world, you can. The question is, are you? Are you? Giving out tracts or copies of daily bread. Some people get in the habit of having a daily bread or a tract with them wherever they go. They're ready for those God-given opportunities to give. You may give out something to someone and never see them again. But the word of God is with them. And you'll find out in heaven, someone will come up to you and say, remember when you gave me? No, I don't remember. Well, you gave me that tract or that daily bread and it started me thinking about God and it was the start of my spiritual journey and I'm here because of what you did. A lot of times there are small things we do and we don't think they're important. They are. We're to be faithful. Posting by video on places like YouTube. Have you ever thought about posting your testimony on YouTube? How you came to faith in Christ? You say, oh, well, who's going to watch? You do not know who's going to watch. If one person watches your video and comes to faith in Christ, is that not worth it? You can edit the, the YouTube, say, oh, I, I don't look really well. I'll, I'll retape it so that I look the way I want to look. And oh, I, I just don't sound too, oh, I'll adjust the sound quality. I'll have it to the point where I like how I look and how I present it. And then you put it out and you leave it in God's hand. Amen. Are you getting the message? There are many ways we can evangelize. Many ways that don't take a lot of time either. By chat. 
Some chat sites are like the Wild West spiritually. If you're not a strong Christian, stay away. Because there are some chat sites that even have the name Christian, and you have those from other religions, like Islam. You have those from, from different cult groups. You have atheists that go on those sites to try to destroy Christians, to try to prevent people from coming to, to faith in Christ. So in those sites, you've got to be strong. What I would do in those sites is I would pray that God would bring me connections to people who did not know the Lord or who needed encouragement in the faith. I have internet friends from 20, 25 years that I connected with and chat and I'm still in connection with. You never know how God will use you. For, younger, for you as, as younger Christians in the faith, if you use that route, be prepared. Be prepared. But when you go and you pray, you can discern by the power of God those who are there who are hungry, who are seeking God. Focus on those, and God will use you. By Facebook group, you can look at your weakness, and God can work through your weakness for his glory. I have long COVID. I had COVID twice. I am still fighting fatigue, memory loss, and other things down the list involving long COVID. I am on a long COVID support group of over 20,000 members. People know I'm a pastor and they know I'm a Christian. And I've had opportunities to make that very plainly know, known in saying, I will pray for you, for, for someone that's struggling. And this site, there are people on that site if they had not found that site, they would be dead through suicide. That site gave them comfort and encouragement. Why I'm saying this? You may have an area of struggle in your life and be able to connect to a support group online of people who are going through the same thing as you, and so you're accepted. Because people say, you are just like me. Because you're going through the same struggles, but you have an extra dimension. You have faith in Christ that many of them don't. And God can use that opportunity for you to share, share your faith with people who are far from God. Inviting people to church. You know, if you, if you crossed off all these previous ones, you have an opportunity for this coming week, for this coming Sunday, for our combined anniversary Thanksgiving potluck opportunity. What is to stop you from calling up a family member, a friend, a fellow worker and say, hey, our church is having its 15th anniversary celebration. I'd like to invite you to come. What is it going to cost you? If people say no, they say no. But they're not going to say yes unless you invite them. This is part of evangelism. You don't have time, you don't have five minutes to invite a family member, a friend, or a fellow worker to come out to our anniversary service. If you say, no, I don't have the time, then I say, that's very sad. Very sad. It's part of the opportunities that God gives us to share. Do you not see there's many ways that we can evangelize? Beyond just one-on-one, -on -one, many ways. What is sad, most Christians are doing nothing. Zero. They're doing nothing to share their faith. Overwhelming majority of Christians have never shared their faith, ever. And yet, Jesus said, go. They're not going. I've shared with you many ways we can go. There are many ways we can share our faith. My challenge to you as a pastor is, are you doing it? Are you taking advantage of the opportunities God gives you to share your faith? Because if you do not, you are denying the command that God has given you to go, number one. And number two, you're showing you have no compassion for those who are lost and are facing an eternity separated from God. Amen? That's the truth. 
<clears throat> Share where you are. Share where you are. Now, I was recently in hospitals in Malawi and in Canada. I didn't say to myself, I'm going to have a nice pity party here and be served and just let the time go by. I used the opportunities to share with staff, medical staff, who came to me. I was in isolation. I couldn't go to people. God brought people to me. I had one day when a pharmacist who was a Muslim woman came and had to check through as to the proper medications to give me. And I took that opportunity to share with her who the real Jesus was. She came to me. I didn't say, oh, I'm in, I'm in isolation and I see you. I won't have any opportunities to share about Jesus. I shared with nurses that came in. One nurse, nurse went and shared with other nurses on the floor. Um, well, we, we have, because of our schedules, we don't get to church much, but God brought this pastor, so we have church with us. Right here on our floor. Share where you are. Use those opportunities. I thank God that in not just having the opportunity to share with those who did not know Christ, but also with nurses whose faith had grown cold. The fire had gone out. With some of those nurses, by the time I left, they were a little bit more on fire than they were before we started our connection in the hospital. There are people who need to hear Jesus from you. There are other Christians who need encouragement because they're under discouragement. They're letting the fires go. Those nurses, they couldn't go to church because of their schedules. But me being there was a source of encouragement for them as a fellow Christian, but also talking in a way that, in, that built them up in their faith. Why do I tie that in with evangelists? Well, if you have nurses there who are built up in the faith, then they may start sharing their faith more in the hospital. So even after you've left, that impact you've had for the glory of God continues through those nurses. Amen? The Holy Spirit will direct you to speak to people at a specific time, giving you specific information to share. There are God-given appointed times for us to go and share with people. There are many times, sometimes God will in, give some information of a Christian to share with the person, and the Christian will say, oh, well, why am I to share this? And then they go to share what God put in their heart, and they'll find out why, because that person needed to hear that at that point particular time. Are we open to the Holy Spirit? Are we obedient to go where he sends us? I use the example of Elizabeth. You know, one day when there were extra tomatoes available in the next door garden that Jacqueline and her mom had, I didn't say to myself, oh well, they'll eventually harvest these tomatoes or the squirrels will get them. <clears throat> I said, well, I'll take the tomatoes since Elizabeth's home was closer, I'll take the tomatoes, extra tomatoes, to Elizabeth's home, took them there. Her mom was home. I, I came in, dropped off the tomatoes. Elizabeth came to where I and her mom were, and God laid on my heart to share something from the book Dune, Fear is the Mind Killer. Have I ever shared that before with anyone? No. Have I shared it since? No. But I did not know she was reading that book at that time and reading that specific part of that book at that time so she could connect to what I shared with her and that opened her heart to hearing about Jesus and she came to faith in Jesus that day. Don't say to yourself and use as an excuse, what can I say if I share? I don't have the words. God will give you the words. That's an excuse. God will give you the wisdom. Sometimes you'll be, as I have different times, inwardly, as the person is nodding their head in agreement, inwardly, I'm nodding my head because what is coming out of me is from the Spirit of God. And I'm just as amazed as they are. He 
if you do very little of the things mentioned, if you say, nope, 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 you can at least pray. You can pray. And we've been called and commanded to do that as well. Or to pray for those who do not know Jesus that we know. We all know people who are separated from God by their sin. We have no excuse not to pray for them. And we're to pray that God will raise up those who will be actively reaching out to these people for the harvest is great. It is an expectation by Jesus of his followers. Matthew 9, verses 35 to 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion. Do you have compassion? For those who are separated from God by, by their sin? Do you have real compassion or do you say, oh, well, so what? If you have indifference, that's sad. That's really sad. In the past, there were men and women of God who would cry, literally cry over the loss in, in prayer. Today, we don't do that. It's, oh, so what? <clears throat> For people, what they face and the judgment of God, if that doesn't bring compassion for them as to where they are headed, unless they come to faith in Christ, then that's said. So he had compassion on the crowds because they were harassed and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. We've been called to share peop with people. He is the way. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We have no excuse if we have written off every one of the suggestions I have made about evangelism. We have no excuse not to pray. Amen? We have no excuse. We'll get into even more difficult verses. Here, here comes stepping on toes. Luke 9, 26. To summarize that verse, Jesus said, you say nothing about me to people, I'll say nothing to my father about you. Very plain. Luke 9, 26, whoever is ashamed of me, if you are not sharing your faith because of fear or because of other excuses, you are ashamed of who you serve. You are ashamed of Jesus if you're not telling people about him. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Matthew 10, verses 32 to 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Very plain words. Very plain. About what we are not to do. We are not to deny him. We are not to be ashamed of following him. We are to proclaim him. To those who need to hear the word. Romans 1 and verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul shared his faith. He, he almost died many, many, many times. He was never ashamed, ashamed of who he served and of who he proclaimed, Jesus. No matter what the cost, he shared. 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name, the name of Jesus. Amen? You share your faith. Not everyone is going to, oh, thank you, thank you. I was just waiting to hear that some people will curse you. Some people will reject you. We can expect that. Jesus said the world hated me and will hate you. But that's not an excuse not to share with those who need to hear about Jesus. That's not an excuse to keep quiet, to keep silent. We are to go. Is your life a testimony? Are people seeing Jesus in, in your life by what you say and what you do? Are you telling people about Jesus? 
The third point is training, discipleship. We are to teach others, Matthew 28, 19. After going, we are to teach. As we see people come to faith in Christ, whether directly through us or through others, if we find spiritual orphans, when I first came to Christ, I was a spiritual orphan. I had no one following me up. I was going in emotion, alone. God may lead you to a young Christian who needs encouragement, who needs support, who needs help to develop their relationship with God through the word and through prayer. And like a little baby, when the baby is born, they don't go right from out of the womb into walking. It takes time for them to grow. They need protection. They need support. They need nourishment, the same as a new Christian. God may call you to mentor someone. It will cost you time. It will cost you frustration at times. Because sometimes, as an older Christian, we expect a new Christian to advance in six months where it took us six years. We get impatient. We forget how long it took us to learn some lessons. Some young Christians are very sharp, and they catch on very fast, but some do not. We need to be patient, but it costs us. Well, look at my agenda. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to this place at this time. Oh, I can't meet with you. Maybe next month. We are to make time for people. And to train them and to disciple them. Paul to Timothy. Paul mentored Timothy as a younger pastor. Timothy was influenced by his grandmother and his mother. We don't hear anything about his father. His father wasn't in the picture. So Timothy was almost, almost like growing up under a single mom. Paul took Timothy under his wing as a younger Christian and mentored him. 2 Timothy 2.2, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul teaching Timothy, who would teach others, who would teach others, who would teach others. That's discipleship. As you teach someone about Jesus they will be encouraged to teach others what you have taught them. So be sure what you have taught them is correct. 2 Timothy 3.14, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. Be careful who you come under teaching from. There are many false prophets today, many false teachers. Find someone who is grounded in the Word of God and correctly interprets the Word of God so that they can mentor you correctly, so that you can have that foundation in your faith to share with others who have no foundation yet as a brand new Christian. It's a precious opportunity to be able to mentor someone and to see them growing. I'm a gardener. I love, love plants. And one of the best times in gardening is seeing the new shoots come up at the start of the, of the gardening season in the spring, but that's when the plant's most vulnerable too. It needs watering, it needs tendering, the same as a young Christian. And what's encouraging is if you mentor someone over years and you see their spiritual growth, you're going, yay! <laughs> They're making it, and especially then you're encouraged when you see them encouraging others because they're starting to disciple others because they've been discipled through you. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. May people imitate your life as you are imitating Jesus. May people not imitate you as you. <laughs> but imitate Christ in you. When you see younger Christians, help them grow in the faith. Palmer Chichen, 
uh, in his book, True Religion, said, my brothers and I had traveled to the western edge of Zimbabwe to raft the Zimb Zambezi River. We boarded our raft at the base of the Victoria Falls. Our guide said when the raft flipped, there was no if the raft flipped or on the off chance we get flipped, but when the raft flipped, he went on, stay in the rough water. You will be tempted to swim toward the stagnant water at the edge of the banks. Don't do it. Because it is in the stagnant water that the crocodiles wait for you. They are large and hungry. I can affirm that from Malawi and the Shire River where every year people are taken by crocs. Even when the raft flips, stay in the rough water. Stagnancy will kill your spirit. The church of tomorrow must resist becoming stagnant. God needs us out there in the rough waters, pouring our lives into people. That's what mentorship is. That's what discipleship is. It's pouring our life into the lives of others in the name of Christ. That takes time and it's costly. Live in the white water. Live where it's just a little bit uncertain and unsafe. That talks not just about discipleship, but also about evangelism. Uncertain, unsafe at times costly. What to share? Jesus is more than a teacher. He's more than a prophet, and he's more than just a philosopher. Matthew 16, verses 15 to 17, Jesus spoke to Peter and said, but what about you, he asked, what, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus is more than the prophet, more than the philosopher, more than the teacher. He's the son of God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Amen? Know Jesus. In knowing him, you can share about him. Acts 4.13, Jesus is the only name under heaven whereby we can be saved, made right with God. John 4. 14, 6, Jesus is the only way to heaven, to God the Father. John 3, 16, Jesus is the only Son of God. There you have a little gospel message, amen? In those few verses, you get to share about the uniqueness of Jesus, that he's more than a philosopher, a teacher, or a prophet, amen? Memorize those scripture verses. Memorize verses like that. So you can share, you may only have a few minutes to share with someone. You may be traveling, may never meet that person again. And you can share in just a very short time who Jesus is, and it may open the door for more conversation. It may not, but at least you've shared the uniqueness of Jesus. Is our life a testimony to how God has changed us? Our words, our actions. Do people see a difference in us? They should. If we're growing in our faith, they should see a difference. Do we tell others about Jesus? There are many ways. We may not be called to be an evangelist, but we are all called and commanded to tell others about Jesus. No excuse, no exceptions. You've been called. You, every one of you here who has acknowledged Jesus as Lord and Savior have been commanded and called to share your faith with others. If you're not doing it, why are you not? Do we help new Christians grow in their faith? As I mentioned, a baby can't walk right away and needs a lot of protective support. A new Christian needs a mentor. Paul mentored Timothy. Are you mentoring anyone? They could be near you or far away. I mentor in person and I mentor by messenger to people in other countries. Don't say, oh, oh, I don't have anyone to mentor. I, I, I just can't be involved in mentoring. Well, pray. You pray, God will bring you someone to mentor. Guaranteed. When we all as believers stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, which we will, in Romans 14, 10, you're going to stand before Jesus. I'm going to stand before Jesus and give an account as to how faithful I have been in serving him now. Part of that faithfulness is in obeying his commandments, and part 
of that is sharing our faith, telling others about him. Amen? It's part of that. What will we say before our Lord and Savior as a Christian if we live the life of telling no one about him? That will not be an enjoyable experience to see the loving eyes of Jesus and to have revealed before the host, all the hosts of heaven that we have told no one about him. How active are you in sharing your faith? I've given you many opportunities and many suggestions as to how you can share your faith. You cannot say to God, I have no time to do any of those things. We all have the time. It's what we do in investing the time we have for the glory of God. It says in Scripture, now is the day of salvation. Our time is precious. We all have the same amount of seconds per day to use. But we invest most of our time for ourselves. God gets the crumbs of our time. The leftover pieces. We can invest a few minutes each day to get to know God better through his word and through prayer, but we can also and should also invest time each day to tell others about him, however that may be. Go. Are you going? In person? By text? By phone? By Facebook? Are you going? Are you telling? I should say, are you going in the sense of your testimony first? <laughs> are people seeing a difference in your life so that when you do go to tell, they say, hey, this person's had a difference, a change in their life. Now I'm going to listen to find out why. Is your life being a testimony? Do people see a change in your life? Are you going to tell them about Jesus? And are you training any new Christians that God has brought across your path? or? Or training Christians who have gone cold in their faith and need revival. That is not just new Christians. God can call us to those who once were burning brightly for Jesus and the fire's gone out. There's, there's very little even smoke. And God can provide us an opportunity to mentor Christians who have fallen away. That we may see them revive. That we may go and... and Fan the flames once again. Are you going? Not an option, it's command. Are you going? Is your life a testimony to the power of God to change? Are people seeing Jesus reflected in your life? Are you saying, Lord, I will be a source of encouragement to others, not when people see me, I have a long list of complaints, and all they hear me doing is whining and complaining. And I never get to talk about Jesus because I haven't had the time to get away from talking about myself. Are people hearing and seeing Jesus in our life? A lot of times we like to complain and we like to focus on our problems. And we never get around to talking about Jesus. And that person may need encouragement, not need to hear a whole list of our complaints while they're struggling with their complaints. They don't need to go down further. They need to be encouraged and lifted up. Is your life a testimony? If people see Jesus in you at school, at work, in your neighborhood, are you reflecting Jesus? Are you shining for Jesus? Are you telling others about him? Those who come to you and ask, and those whom you go to and tell, and are you praying for opportunities to encourage others in their faith or whether they be new in the faith or older in the faith? So this is a challenge today for each one of us as followers of Jesus. The time is short. We do not know how much time we have here. I almost died in August. We can be dead tomorrow. The people we are around can be dead tomorrow who don't know Jesus. Jesus could come back at any time. He said, be ready. Part of being ready is not just being spiritually prepared, but we're just still actively being, being in a position of proclaiming him while we wait. 
so that others may also come to the point of faith where they also are ready because they know Jesus. Because once he comes, I would not want to be here when the Christians are withdrawn from this world. It will not be a nice place to be. Do you have compassion for the lost? Does it grip your heart for those that you know that don't know Jesus? Does it impel you to pray for them and to tell them about you? If they reject, that's not your fault. It's their responsibility, but they can't reject unless they're provided an opportunity to say yes or no. The angels aren't going around testifying about Jesus. We who have experienced the new birth and have been born again by the Spirit of God and are a new creation in Christ Jesus are the ones who have been called to go and witness. Amen? Not the angels. It says one day we shall rule over angels. We've been elevated by faith higher than the angels. But the angels are not given responsibility to proclaim the good news. We are. A command, no excuse. I pray under God that we will be willing to obey what Jesus has called us to do. I'm willing to obey in being what God has called us to be. Holy, set apart for him growing in our relationship with him. In closing, I'd like to close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray that you will have spoken to the hearts of those here and the hearts of those watching now and in future. I pray, Lord, that you will lay conviction on the hearts of those who are not sharing their faith at all, not using any opportunity to tell others about Jesus. I pray that you will bring conviction to those whose lives are not a testimony to you because of sin because of, of not having that desire to be the men and women, boys and girls you've called them to be. I pray that you will convict others who have opportunity to share with other Christians who are discouraged or those who are new in the faith. Lord, in all of these areas, help us to obey you and to do what you've called us to do without hiding behind excuses. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that you've been encouraged by this message this morning. But don't just be encouraged by it. Put it in practice. Messages that come forth by the word of God that convict us by the spirit of God are not to be forgotten. They're to be put in, put in practice. We're to apply them. At this point, we prepare our hearts for communion. Those of you who are watching online, you can have have juice or water, bread or crackers. And if you have professed Jesus as Lord and Savior and, and you do not have sin in your life, then you are called to partake of communion. So we will be participating in the Lord's Supper and remembering his sacrifice on the cross. I will read from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes and we thank god that jesus rose from the dead that we proclaim that in communion and that one day as he left and as he promised he will come back maranatha even so lord jesus come so at this time we will quiet our hearts as we partake of of the communion during the service As we take this wafer, we think of that body that was broken out of love for us. Jesus who hung on the cross, unrecognizable because of the beating that he went through. And he did it willingly. He could have had a legion of angels take him out of the Garden of Gethsemane. But out of obedience to the Father and love for us, he went to the cross. In memory of that sacrifice he made on your behalf. Take, eat.
Remember that blood that was shed for the remission, the forgiveness of our sins. As I mentioned many times, the hymn that said, there's power in the blood. Jesus poured out his life for us. Take, drink. Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, that you have promised to be with us always to the end of the world. We thank you, Lord, for your strength, for your peace, for the hope that is in you as we serve you day by day in the time that has been given to us until you call us by death, until you come, or unless you come in person to call us to your presence while we are still alive. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in prophetic times. Our times could be short for the coming of Jesus. Be ready. Be prepared. But be rejoicing. Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Jesus. God bless you. May he continue to strengthen, guide, and direct you as you faithfully serve him day by day. To him be all the glory. And unless he comes again, and unless we are called before then, we will see you all here again through our anniversary service next week. Praise God. Take care. And may you experience his blessings even through the testings that you may experience in this coming week. Until by the grace of God we meet again. Goodbye for now. <laughs>